Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for Dagger of the Mind, which is episode 11 of season 1 of Star Trek the Original Series. This video is part of a series of videos where I review episodes of Star Trek, uh, the original series one episode at a time. Uh, in this video, I will cover the um, first season episode, Dagger of the Mind. So, Dagger of the Mind is the episode in which um, Kirk uh, is the Enterprise delivering a surprise to um, a, um, a penal colony a, a, uh, that's supposed to rehab uh, people with men criminally mental disorders. However, uh, someone escapes. Uh, and so Kirk has to return to the colony, and this person has seemed to lost their mind, but they find out that this person is in fact a doctor that worked there, not an inmate. So Kirk beams down with the psychiatrist, who has a bit of a crush on him, in order to investigate, and during the course of the investigation, they find that the man, Dr. Adams, who is running the facility, is testing this experimental mind control device that he is using for nefarious purposes to control people's minds and eventually Kirk and uh, Spock uh, get the better of them and they manage to break free and in the meanwhile the uh, Dr. Adams is killed by his own device. Um, so first of all I gotta mention that I'm foregoing the green screen <laughs> for this video. Uh, not that I'm giving up on it entirely. I still like to do I still haven't released any videos to the public yet as of the recording of this video, so I don't know how the green screen is going to be received. Unless I get like a lot of complaints and people not really not liking it, then I, I want to continue using it because I actually kind of like it. But, today, my kitties... <laughs> We're all cuddled up all perfectly, so I thought, well, why bother with the green screen when they would make a good background? Although, you can't see Lillian up on top very well unless she, like, moves. Um, but you can see these other kitties in the background. Lillian! There she is. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um... So yeah, so so this is uh yeah, so I'm not, I haven't given up on the green screen is all I'm saying. But anyway, um as for this episode Dagger of the Mind, um it's okay. I talked about it in what little girls made of that there's uh that I was about to cover several episodes that uh were kind of just forgettable and yeah i was referring to this one uh as long as well as uh what are little gir girls made of i uh, to me these are the episodes kind of in the middle of the season that are um you know just forgettable now i know that they weren't aired in the same order because i'm not good going by air dates but but they were made back to back and they're very similar episodes, in my opinion, because they both deal with Kirk investigating a brilliant scientist, and everyone, there's someone there who thinks the scientist is brilliant and can do no wrong. Turns out that they're evil and have some, like, nefarious plans to take over the galaxy or whatever. And But the whole time, someone's, like, on the cruise in denial. It's like, no, this is a brilliant scientist. He wouldn't do this. So <laughs> it is distracting to get the same storyline <sighs> twice in a row. Also... I think, I don't know, I was going to say a, a what are little girls made of is worse, but now I'm thinking maybe this is worse, and maybe they're both on par, <laughs> because what little girls are made of is definitely more boring and less harder. I had, like, more issues with it. It was seemed more contrived. Whereas this, the biggest complaint I have is that Dr. Adams is, uh, not Dr. Adams, sorry, Dr. I can't even remember... The psychiatrist that Kirk beams down with that has the hots for him, Helen is her first name, because she kept insisting they refer to her as Helen, so that's the only name I remember her by. Anyway, uh, Helen uh, was being completely obtuse in, in this episode, being like, Oh, Dr. Adams is a brilliant scientist, what are you talking about? And it, there's one thing that she does is I think is absolutely excuses inexcusable and makes her a really incompetent officer is the whole reason they went down there is to investigate why that Dr. Geller like is 
you know, act insane. And Dr. Adams even told them, like his official account is, oh, he was uh, testing out this experimental treatment and it backfired. And so when they were like walked by the, um, I can't even remember what they call the mind control chair or whatever. I can't remember the official uh, name for it. But anyway, when they walked by it and Kirk's like, oh, let me investigate this, uh, you know, Helen was like, why? Why are you going to investigate it? Well, what's the point? No, why are you going to waste it? And she was like actively arguing with them. And he, he, Dr. Adams referred to it as a, a um, experimental device that was malfunctioning. That's why they're fucking there. <laughs> That's the whole point of them going there. To investigate this device that calls Dr. Kelly to go insane. And yet she's like arguing vehemently with Kirk that he shouldn't bother looking at it. In fact, Dr. Adams, now he's very sus though. <laughs> um, he's, um, doesn't volunteer the fact that this was the device that actually caused the harm to Dr. Gelly. It wasn't until after Kirk started investigating. He's like, so is this the device that Dr. Gelly hurt himself on? And I was like, yes, this is the one. I'm like, well, why the fuck did you not mention that before? So it's, it's the sheer incompetence of everyone trying to be like, oh, this is a brilliant sign. Yeah, so that level of the obtuseness of being, well, this is a brilliant scientist, was worse in this episode than it was in what our little girl's made of, which is how I think this episode is worse, but as I said, that in other ways it's better. So it kind of evens out. Um, now, I think the, I gotta talk about Dr. Geller, uh, this actor who, I think I actually saw Omega Glory first before I saw this episode, because the same actor was in Omega Glory, because I remember seeing this episode and being like, hey, it's another evil captain guy from Omega Glory. Um, but he is, um, let's see, chewing the scenery, uh, <laughs> eating a lot of ham cheese or however you want to say it like he is way over the top i always picked to this when people uh would complain about the overacting alternative factor i always look to this episode and be like D did you see this did you see this guy <laughs> he's much worse he's like but i would like to take me back i don't want to go back <laughs> it's just like my god dude just calm down like i know he's supposed to be portraying someone having like a psychotic breaker whose mind has been shattered for this device but it is so artificial and so cheesy and and really 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 do not buy his performance i think it may be i may have to be as bold i may be make this bold statement maybe i'll change my mind as i go through the original series but then again i just watched the whole thing not that long ago at the start of the year but i want to make the bold statement and say this may be the worst performance in the entire show and that is a bold statement because there's a lot of bad over the top performances and i think this may be the worst <laughs> just my opinion and it was so distracting um when watching this episode so anywho uh, <laughs> um what else is i gonna say all oh, the kitties look so cute i get distracted by them that's the problem with having them in the background but anyway <laughs> so all right so then there's Dr. Adams. Now, Dr. Adams, I actually think, is kind of a, a well-written character, and I dare say well-performed, or maybe it just seems well-performed in comparison to that other terrible performance. But it, rang, it rings true to me, the portrayal of Dr. Adams, because I've, with my own personal real-life experience, I've met a lot of people and... And sometimes, you know, you try not to judge someone entirely when you from first impressions, but it does stick with you. And there is, and I think most of the times when I have this feeling strongly, it always turns out to be true. When someone is too nice to you, like their their niceness seems a bit artificial in a way, and they go out of their way to try to be like super nice, but in a way that does not seem sincere. That just seems fake usually like very um 
extrovert, very, you know, friendly, very talkative, like, oh, hey, buddy, how's it going? How's your day? Like, a certain kind of that. Like, there's a different kind that's more sincere that I trust, but there's this kind that is seems insincere in the face. And it usually comes from people with who are either secretly assholes or have nefarious purposes. Maybe someone suffering from... Uh, from addiction or someone with a you know a, a stealing problem or someone who someone who is trying to deceive you who is disingenuous and and I've encountered that several times so and so my sort of spidey sense goes off when I see someone being like too friendly I'm like uh oh this person is not gonna work out <laughs> um, and that's what the sense I got with Dr. Adams. And so that's what I think that it portrayed it so well that he had that, and it seems so like familiar to my you know personal experience, he had that super nice over the top, well, Captain, oh, you're always right. You're welcome to beam down. And I like how like at the start where, um, you know, he didn't demand that Kirk return Dr. Geller. And so Kirk asked him, was like, so what would you like to, you know, what should we do with Dr. Gelly? He's like, well, I recommend you take him to a star base with superior medical facilities so he can get the best treatment possible. And Kirk's like, oh, yeah, that sounds reasonable. And when he puts it on mute, McCoy's like, he knows damn well that there's no other facility anywhere nearby with better treatments. They're the best option. Uh, and so... That caps it, and he, McCoy is totally right. He did know that. He, his niceness and, and willing to cooperate was so insincere. And just like when Helen was arguing that Kirk shouldn't, uh, you know, investigate the device, you know, illogically, but um, Adams came in and was like, oh, you might as well give up. Kirk's determined. You're not going to win that argument. <laughs> and clearly he didn't want them to investigate it either. Like, the whole, like, deceptive, schmormy way that he was betrayed, I think was actually really well done <laughs> and, and and rang true that that that, that is how some people who are, who's got to see or trying to deceive you try to um, confuse you or get let your let you make you let your guard down by being overly nice to you but I think if you are smart enough you could catch on to this and I don't think Kirk probably should have been a bit smart but Kirk was smart enough to know that something was off he could tell <laughs> that something was off whereas as I said Helen was being completely incompetent he was like what are you talking about he's a brilliant scientist I'm like come on you suck at this <laughs> you're supposed to be a psychologist and you can't tell that he's obviously something's up here I don't know anyway <laughs> and and the other thing they were being really obtuse to is the you know, everyone else at the facility, like the other inmates and the other people that worked there, were all, like, super blank. They were all like, yes, I enjoy working here. How is your day? <laughs> it's like, come on, Kirk! Don't be such a fucking moron! Hmm, maybe something seems a bit off. Maybe it's because they're acting like they're fucking brainwashed. And they're like, yes, I do enjoy working here. Would you like something to eat? I am going to walk. <laughs> and then Helen, of course, is completely obtuse. Like, oh, everything seems normal to me here. It's not like these guys are acting like fucking weird. <laughs> I think maybe they overdid it with how, <laughs> how blank the other people were. Um, yeah, so... So that's also a huge knock against this episode because they're, they're being kind of incompetent. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and also I didn't really like the, I, I'm getting sick of every, Kirk has to be the hottest man alive in every episode and all the women have to go absolutely crazy over him. I get, I get kind of sick of that, but, you know, that's the original series for you, how this, this chick has the hots 
for Kirk and because they met at a Christmas party apparently but they you know never actually hooked up so she was like when she had him under the device and they were testing it and he, she was like saying oh what if we actually did hook up and then Adams came in and used that as oh you're madly in love with her you causes you pain not to be around her and this is when of course he reveals his you know evil mustache starts twirling and this is when he reveals he's a villain which and yeah so i wasn't a huge fan of that whole subplot i'm sick of women going crazy over kirk but speaking of adams twirling his mustache what what i don't i don't think they were really clear on what his ultimate motivations were like he's creating this mind control device for sure and he used it on the people that he works with to fuck them up but what to what ends like what is his ultimate goal because he's trying to hide it from Kirk does he intend to like I said at the start of the video that he has nefarious purpose to take over the galaxy but that was more referring to what little girls are made of which they made it clear what his motivations were here they don't I don't really get what his motivations are and what he intended to accomplish by brainwashing Kirk other than to get the Enterprise to go away but what was his ultimate goal what if he got the Enterprise to go away and stop investigating what would he do next would he send Kirk as an agent on the ship to what ends like so that was very unclear um, once I look at it and so that didn't make much sense and then they had oh god I just started to have to talk about the first scene of the episode where the transporter chief is trying to beam stuff to the planet and it's like it's not working and then Kirk comes by as uh you know this is a penal colony right you know they got like a shield that you can't beam through and he's like oh yeah and Kirk to be fair chastises him is like I suggest you read up on the procedures for penal colonies I don't fucking buy that anyone operating a transporter would forget something as easy as that. And I think that Kirk actually, people would remind them, be like, hey, there's a field that we need to ask permission. They wouldn't just like have him going like, oh, why isn't this damn thing working? And it's obvious, so that whole scene was plot contrivance because it was a very sloppy way to... Um, get this exposition out to the audience there's basically it's a way to let the audience know that they can't beam through the shields and so they're like oh let's have this transporter chief be wildly bad at his job and incompetent and, and by the way even the command crew bad at their jobs for not even communicating with the transporter chief that this was that they needed to lower the shield so everyone was being portrayed bad at their job as a contrived way to get this information to the audience doesn't work <laughs> It just comes off as really bad writing. Um, and then later, like, they, they have another moment where it's kind of, like, contrived. Oh, look, the audience know when uh, Helen goes to shut the power down, Kirk's like, you gotta be careful. If you touch the wrong thing, you could die, which, of course, is what happens. Well, not with her, but with this other dude that attacks her that she kicks him into the thing and he dies. So you see Chekhov's gun but very fucking obvious but anyway <sighs> and and she's like and when he asked kirk asked her is like do you have any training with how to you know with power devices like this she's like no and he's like ah you'll be all right <laughs> like she could have killed herself now i know she has a line like well anything's better than dr adam's device but still that doesn't excuse it she's going off with like no training whatsoever to try to deactivate something that could kill her <sighs> anyway and then at the end of the episode they said dr geller uh, like being back to the colony and took over but he's fucking insane he <laughs> how can he take over when he's going I won't let you take over! like he was still like completely incapacitated how could he take i don't know <laughs> it doesn't make any sense Oh, and speaking of Dr. Geller, i got to talk about this was the first episode to feature the mind meld. And I've heard them talk about this before, that it was a plot contrivance for them to try to... And they do this a couple times. Like, all the Vulcan things, basically, were made up to... 
resolve an issue with the plot, basically. They're like, oh, God, how are we supposed to figure this out? Oh, let's just, Spock's an alien. Let's just say he has this Vulcan abilities that's going to let us resolve this problem in the plot. And in this case, it was the, the mind mountain. And he, even Spock says, like, this is a dangerous thing that hasn't been operated for thousands of years, which... That doesn't make any sense. Like, why <laughs> Why would they just bring it up now? And how would he know how to do it if it hasn't been done for thousands of years? And and we know from stuff that takes place before that they're not consistent with this, which they shouldn't be. Although, I think Enterprise tried to be because they made making Vulcan 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 My Mouse taboo uh, 100 years before, so it wasn't ex an accepted practice. But still, like... I don't think they should have done that. I think they, they should just <coughs> ignore this line because it's nonsensical. It's certainly doing Discovery because they do Vulcan my mouths a lot. Which they should. And I, I, I praise it for that. But anyway, <laughs> like I, I had this talk before in my uh, Balance of Terror review. You should not try to be consistent with some of the canon stuff. Especially in the earlier episodes of the original series. Because they were not thinking ahead at all. And sometimes it's just cannot compute and you just have to defy it but anyway <laughs> um so i want to try something new with uh, my reviews before i give my rating for the review i'm going to start off with my shout outs to my patron supporters who support the channel thank you so much um, for supporting Enchantment of Eternity really keeps me going. Uh, we have Anthony D. Benedictus, Ricky Manny Jester, Joel Lavals, Brian A., Alessandro Miglesio, uh, Norman Buckwald, Stephen Kennedy, Britton Berg, Allison Fordyce, and Brandon House. Thank you all so very much for your contributions. Does really help the channel uh, keep going. Um, so, uh, yes, I want to try something new, as I said. So, um, I've seen several other YouTube channels do this, um, most specifically the Penske file, which I thought was an actually pretty good feature to have at the end of the video, is to ask my Patreon supporters if they would like to comment on the episode um, that I'm reviewing, and I'll read their comments to include it in my video, because I love this... Uh, audience participation, especially for my loyal patron supporters, and uh, you know, give back and have their voice be heard. And it's interesting to get different perspectives in these videos here, other than just mine. So, <laughs> um, let me read. I believe we got three comments to read for this episode. First comment is from Ricky. That says, this episode was very forgettable and boring. It also gives me a headache whenever they use the torture machine. They are There are more cons than pros in the story. However, the one saving grace was the introduction of the Vulcan mind meld, which is established in Star Trek lore. But other than that, this episode was boring. My rating is a 4 poor. Uh, and yeah, that's a good point Ricky Bing brings up about the headaches because I, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> I always thought the same thing when watching this episode growing up is that woo, woo, woo noise always gives me a headache. In fact, when I watched it just now, I had to turn whenever they like when Dr. Adams would turn the volume up all the way and the thing would get super loud, I would turn the volume way down on my TV. And once they were done with the scene, I would turn it back up. They, yeah, they, they didn't get the sound balance right. It does give me a headache. <laughs> um, so, another comment uh, from Matty Jester. He says, uh, it's an unremarkable mystery story, which is blindly obvious Dr. Adams is up to shenanigans, but it takes ages for them to figure it out. I did laugh at the scene where Kirk tells Helen she needs to turn off the power, asks if she's familiar with the power unit. She says no, tells her if she gets it wrong, she'll die and sends her off with no further <laughs> instructions. Great work, Captain. But yeah, I'm going to... I'm going with the five rating, not the worst, just ma, meh. Um, 
That's a good point, Matty. I, of course, I talked about this earlier. I actually didn't realize that Matty had mentioned this in his comment as well when I mentioned it. It's just something I also noticed when watching this episode. That Yeah, he's just like, ah, you'll be fine. Go off and to touch the dangerous thing that could kill you. <laughs> yes, yeah, that, that was quite funny. Um... So, last comment we have is from Brandon Howes. Um, unlike most people, I really enjoyed this episode and find it quite scary, but adding Helen Knoll was a massive mistake. Ooh, Kirk's been fraternizing with a female officer. Shock, horror, yawn. We all know uh, Tristan Adams is a sketchy dude, so why doesn't Kirk mute the transmission when McCoy is expressing his doubts about Adams? Noteworthy for the first Vulcan mind meld, and at least two of the residents of uh, Tantalus get killed in this episode. A practice run for much better. A uh, practice run for the much better whom gods destroy. Six out of ten. Um, yes, I agree. Whom gods destroy, also, because that also dealt with the criminally uh, insane, but in a much, but much better, much, much better episode. I absolutely agree. Brandon's one of the people out there that agrees with me on whom gods destroy, because most people don't love it as much as I do, because I am not an insect! I'm Lord Guard! Anyway, I'll get there. Uh, actually, no, I think I already reviewed that episode. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, so... Thank you so much, um, uh, Ricky, Maddie, and Brandon for leaving comments, and everyone else, of course, supporting me on Patreon. Thank you so much for your support. So my rating for Dagger of the Mine uh, out of 10, I'm going to give it a 5. Average. Um, same rating as I gave What Are the Little Girls Made Of. I'm actually more sort of concrete on this five, where which is What Are the Little Girls Made Of. So I was thinking maybe I should give it a four, but I gave it the the benefit of the doubt and gave it a five. Here I'm, I'm pretty set on a five because it, it wasn't terrible. As I said, I like the portrayal of uh, Dr. Adams uh, as trained uh, true to life. Um, and it was the seeing the Vulcan mind meld done and seeing like you know Kirk trying to navigate this uh, precarious situation, him being like tortured by this thing was was somewhat interesting. But the big strikes a bit against this episode is the obtuse way people are just <laughs> obtuse to what the really obvious shenanigans <laughs> as Manny put it going on and the plan the way they're so oblivious to people going yes I am fine how are you I mean Dr. Adam's swarmy behavior I can kind of give it a pass to because Kirk was suspicious and he his swarmy behavior wasn't like outright like a red flag the way that the people going how are you today like that was the red flag <laughs> like and and how incompetent Helen was being by being like oh you shouldn't even investigate this machine that's the whole purpose we came here to investigate in the first place like what's wrong with you how can she be so bad at her job so <laughs> so those are those are the the complaints that I had about this episode but overall it wasn't the worst thing ever there was enough here here to sort of keep it interesting but as i said at the top this is a very forgettable forgettable episode because if it were really bad i would be more memorable <laughs> it's kind of just in that meh middle place uh as uh, yeah as i believe ricky said yeah but uh yes i i agree it's in, it's in that middle place it's in the very forgettable just like the previous episode two very forgettable episodes in the beginning of season one so that is it for my review of Dagger of the Mind. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, be sure to check out my channel as I cover uh, more episodes of Star Trek The Original Series. Uh, let me get out the schedule and be more specific, though. <laughs> um, so coming up next, let's see if I can find it. Uh, so, so Thursday, of course. Um, oh, no, wait. To Wednesday will be Miri. Uh, my review for the episode Miri uh, will be coming out on my channel on Wednesday and Thursday, of course, Prodigy. And then Saturday, I will be back on Patreon for my revisited for Conscience of the King 
because I already reviewed that episode so exclusively on Patreon will be uh, my Conscience of the King revisited on Saturday but before then Wednesday for everyone on my main channel will be Miri alright so yeah be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that and my many other reviews that I do and thanks a lot for watching